Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, for a couple weeks now, there was a thanks that I wanted to give, and I, I just kept slipping my mind, and I'd get caught up in other things. But, um, you know, we often give kind of general thanks, and, and in a general way, I want to thank all of the people that commit to teaching Sunday school, for taking time to go over and, and share with the kids what God has laid on their heart, to instruct them, to teach them godly principles. But uh, this week, I'm, I'm actually going to single out one particular teacher, just because I've seen the impact that he's had on my children. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dominic for his faithfulness in teaching, and you know the. The, the cool thing about Dominic is he's not saying anything in the class that he's not living out day in and day out. And it's, it's a, a blessing to be around somebody that just has the nature of an evangelist in them that just has a love for people. And, and I wanted to say thank you, Dominic, for sharing that with our kids when you teach in Sunday school. Honor and thank you very much. <laughs> your kids are great. All of these kids, they're just impressive. They really are. Yeah. They really are. Thank you. It's a, so, it's a privilege. Take that as an encouragement, because we need more Sunday school teachers. <laughs> um, we are continuing with our uh, testimony uh, period. I've asked uh, Shaylin if she would come up and share her testimony. So I'm going to turn it over to her. And um, Benjamin, that means you're responsible for all the children you know your, your voice your children make. So. <laughs> Now she's not sure she wants to come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's weird. I don't mind talking to people, but being in front of a group of people really bothers me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I thought it was interesting that I was asked to give my testimony this month um, because it was when I was about eight or nine, I'm not sure which. The night of Christmas or Christmas Eve, um, I gave my life to Jesus. So this is kind of like my birthday. Uh, a little background, my mom had come to Christ when she was young, my dad when I was really small. So for the most part, I was raised in a Christian home. Um, and, uh, you know, I was you know, a typical kid, energetic, prankster kind. Um, I love Sunday school, church, memorizing Bible verses, as long as it didn't take too long. <laughs> um, I love learning about the Bible. Um, you know, in my mind, my parents were Christians. Um, we went to church. I loved God. I thought I was a follower of Christ. You know? uh, then um, came the day when I found out I wasn't. Um, Christmas Eve, Christmas, I, I don't remember that part. My dad wanted us to understand Christmas wasn't about getting stuff. Uh, he read to us from his Bible, um, the Christmas story, then continued on talking about the reason behind it, the cross. He told the salvation message to us. I can't recall all his words exactly. I do remember um, one of the verses he read, the one speaking about um, how without Jesus it was impossible to please God and all our attempts were filthy rags. That devastated me. Up to this point, I really thought I loved God and I would belong to Him. Now I learned everything was, not the hope, was like dirty rags. And, um, that really wrecked my world. Um, I never said anything. Um, I went to bed that night and I, I actually remember I got in bed and then I climbed back out and knelt beside my bed. Um, just still really crushed, uh, realizing what I actually was before God and everything uh, my dad had said clicked. I began praying and crying. Um, kind of in that moment, um, I gave my life to Jesus. Um, after all of, you know, after that moment, um, getting back into bed, I can't ex describe the excitement and thrill of that moment. Um, I know a lot of people don't really have, um, I guess, an experience after giving their life, and I don't think necessarily it was anything, you know, especially huge, but um, I couldn't stop smiling. 
I was crying and squealing. If you've ever seen an excited little girl, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Just smiling, quietly squealing. I couldn't stop moving. Just um, the peace and joy that I had um, at that moment was incredible, and I physically couldn't contain myself. Um, And then after I, I was trying to calm myself down because if I get too loud, I'd get in trouble. <laughs> but um, when I got somewhat still, I had the sensation like I was actually floating out of my bed. I swung my arms back to grab my bed because the feeling was so real. I actually bruised one of my arms from doing it. <laughs> but um, it, that stuck in my mind. Just, and it was just simply the peace and joy of um, being completely forgiven and made right before God um, is what I was experiencing. And since that moment, there have been many different circumstances that God has used to grow me. Uh, really reflecting on com my coming to Jesus and growing in Jesus, um, one thing that has been absolutely instrument instrumental was my dad's example. Uh, him telling me what Christmas was about, uh, taking us to church, being ready to help others. Um, I can remember uh, when we w lived in uh, Federalsburg, he had to go to work um, in uh, D.C. Uh, he got up at five, four or five in the morning. I wasn't supposed to be up, but I can remember looking in between um, the railings of our stairs, and my dad would be at the table reading and praying, and that just uh, stuck in my mind forever of how important it was to see my dad at the table, and it, you know, daylight was far away. Um, he already had to get up ridiculously early just for work. Um, And many other things, those are just kind of a few that stuck in my mind, things that I remember. Um, and looking back, I didn't even realize how closely I was watching and learning um, in many of the things. Looking back, I realized how much I was. Um, and I guess uh, overall, it reminds me of the responsibility before God as a Christian parent um, to tell our kids about Jesus, help shape them, uh, to be the people he's called them to be. Um, and also the fact that we are examples, whether we like it or not, for better or for worse. Um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, <laughs> how I can Jesus. if she would give her testimony. I wasn't sure she was going to say yes. But she just stared at me. <laughs> and I guess she was just thinking, contemplating, because she was very willing to do so when uh, it came down to it. But, uh, Kind of a few intimidating moments there. <laughs> Guess where we're going to be today? <coughs> what? Colossians. Well, we're going to be there for a minute. <laughs> Open to Colossians, if you would, please. <coughs> we're not going to be where you think we are. <laughs> We're going to jump back to Colossians chapter 2. Real quick, off the top of your head, first word that comes to your mind when I say Christmas. Jesus, okay? Second word. Come on, there's some of you that didn't think Jesus. There's some of you that thought presents or lights or food. There you go. <laughs> Friends and family. <laughs> what? Snow. Yeah, I 
especially if you live in the South. Evidently not here. <laughs> I got friends in Oklahoma that they had a, a storm moving in, and uh, the storm was supposed to hit Friday morning. Thursday night, they closed the schools. <laughs> they hadn't even snowed yet, and they closed the schools. <laughs> Which is good because they got four inches of snow, so you know. Um, so we were I was thinking about Christmas and I and I talked to several of my family members and I said, I just want you to tell me, just kind of sum up for me what Christmas means to you. Just using single words. I don't want long oratorical expressions, I just want single words. And, and the ones that, that came up most often were family. I took Jesus out of it because Jesus was always the first one, just like you guys were. So I took Jesus out and I just wanted their expressions about the holiday season, okay? So I said family, love, joy, peace, merry, decorations, gifts, excitement. Okay, those are the ones that came up most often. I got some other ones. Eggnog. <laughs> and I couldn't fit that in with what we're talking about today. So. Nowhere in here could I find eggnog. <laughs> it goes with joy. So, Colossians chapter 2. We're going to read uh, verse 16 and 17. And Nathan, it, there's something hissing back here, is it? It's all off. It might okay, be the base amp. Be the base amp, okay. Um, Verse 16, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. I love to celebrate Christmas. It's just one of those times of year that... that um, hey, Ben, you turn that off for me, please? The base amp. I don't even know where the switch is. Um, all of those things that I just described seem to happen around Christmas. Even with atheists, they seem to enjoy a season of peace, a, a season of joy. Um, they, they want the sign to say something besides Merry Christmas. We'll, we'll do Happy Holy Days, but we don't want Merry Christmas. Okay, so we'll do Happy Holy Days and... and uh, you know, but there's there's just something about the season. And I was looking through these passages, and, and uh, should we celebrate Christmas? Yes. Should we celebrate Christmas with decorations? Why not? Should we celebrate Christmas with food? Why not? Should we celebrate Christmas with joy? Yes. Absolutely. With peace? Hopefully. We work really hard to kind of push peace out of it with all the Black Friday and all the weird shopping and you got to get this particular one and it's got to be at this time so you can get the best deal. And, and for those of you that love that stuff, God bless you. <laughs> I don't. Because I can sit in the warmth of my house and go to walmart.com and push a button and they bring it right to my door. Which works for me. So, what I'm going to do today, I want to first establish the fact that Christmas is worth celebrating. Now, we understand that, but I'm, I'm talking about <gasps> Christmas trees, oh no. no. Christmas trees. Okay, what about uh, bells? Bells. Well, should we have bells at Christmas? Why not? Why not? Now, I read an interesting article. I was doing actually quite a bit of research online. And, and you wouldn't believe the wide spectrum of what should be allowable at Christmas. Everything from, you know, nothing. We don't celebrate anything. Boo. To, we celebrate everything. Happy Kwanzaa. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I don't know. But that's okay. I mean, happy Kwanzaa, whenever that is. Happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas. And everything in between. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I don't know what reindeer have to do with anything. 
Maybe that's part of the food. <laughs> well, yeah, I noticed there's a dearth of reindeer in the valley, so they must have been hunted out. I don't, you know, I don't know. I said last week, and I want to reiterate today, it's not the celebration that's the problem, it's the focus of the celebration. If your tree has become more important to you than the manger, then we've got a problem. If the lights are more important to you than the promise that was kept, if the receiving or even the giving of gifts is more important to you than the gift that was shared on that day, then we've got a problem. All of those things are okay, keeping in mind what we just read. Don't let anyone pass judgment on you with the question of food or drink, even if you're eating reindeer. <laughs> or with regard to a festival, Christmas, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are shadows of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. See, we're celebrating dimly that something that will be realized in days to come. We're practicing celebrating today for a celebration that is going to take place at some point in the indefinite future. Don't know. Could be tomorrow. Could be this afternoon. Could be a hundred years from now. I don't know. God has not seen fit to enlighten me. Which is good because then I don't look stupid when I get it wrong. But there is a celebration coming. Now I want to go back through and I want to go back through the list that we have. And like I said, I've taken Jesus out of the picture. Because we're going to talk about Jesus as, in Christmas in coming weeks. You know, the closer we get to Christmas, we're going to get the whole Christmas story thing. Not the one about Santa Claus or Rudolph or Frosty. We're going to talk about the real Christmas. <laughs> But what about Mary? Does anybody know what Mary means? When they say Merry Christmas, what does that mean? Joyous. 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 Happy. Did you, know, did you know originally it meant somber reflection? I was floored when I saw that. I, I don't think I'd tell anyone Merry Christmas now. Because it kind of goes completely against the lights and the sparkles, doesn't it? Somber reflection on the birth of Christ, on celebrating Christ. It fits. But over the years, we've kind of taken that and it's kind of turned. You know, it's kind of funny how culture can do that. It can take a word that had an original meaning and twist it. And, and we've kind of done that with Mary. Now, Mary is not really bad. You know what we, we say today is giving pleasure. Have a pleasurable Christmas. Delightful. Joy. Uh, a number of you said joyous. Um, mirthful. Marked by festivity. <coughs> Or gaiety. Or gaiety. There's another one. There's another one that got twisted, didn't it? So, Mary. Have a Merry Christmas. Have a, let's go back to the original. Let's have a somber reflection on the birth of Christ that we're celebrating now. That fits. Or let's, let's update it a little bit and say, have a joyous celebration on the birth of Christ that we're celebrating now. That fits too. I'm okay with that. But let's look at some of these other words. Family. Christmas for me, quite honestly, the gifts don't really do it for me a whole lot. I'm, I'm, I would rather give a gift than receive a gift. That doesn't really bother me too much. But above that, I would rather have family. I want all of the family together at one time to drink eggnog. <laughs> And that was one of the, the stipulations that we laid down with the kids. Said, we understand you've got your own family now. You have your in-laws that you have to consider. What we would ask is, in as much as is possible, everybody get together at the same time. I don't care if it's Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, Christmas evening. I don't care. Just everybody try to be together so that we as a family can celebrate Christmas. Okay? Family is important. Do you know that God thinks families are important too? Did you know that God established families? I mean, you know, kind of the whole Garden of Eden thing. There's man. Oh, he needs help. He needs somebody to share his eggnog with. <laughs> he needs somebody to make said eggnog. <laughs> so I will give him 
woman. And God established him, and the two became one. Okay? God established the principle and the dynamic of family. Now, sin has twisted it. Sin has torn it. Sin has made it into things that it was never intended to be. But God designed it and established it and called it to be. Okay? Um, I've got probably 20 or 25 scriptures we're going to go through today, so don't worry about flipping to them. If you want my notes after, I'll happily share them so you can get notes if, if you missed anything. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Wow. Did you catch that? God has set the families. But not just the ones we're born with on this earth. It's not just grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, and then children and nephews and nieces and grandchildren and all of that. Because it's in heaven and on earth. Do you get that? Let me, let me explain a little bit further. Um, in Psalms 68.6, God sets the solitary in a home. And another translation says, God sets the lonely in families. You understand that? God knows that we are supposed to be a part of something. Let's go one step further. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 28-30, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking to the disciples, not you. Okay? Here's where he's talking to us and everyone, because we were included in everyone. Okay? Everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Also says in another gospel, it says, in this life, and in the life to come. Now, does that mean, you know, you split off from your spouse, and you forsake your children, and go out looking for a new one? No. No. Because God despises divorce. What, uh, you know, we just finished our, our love and respect class, our marriage class. And, um, you know, one of the, the counsels that God gives godly women is to live godly and reverent lives that their unbelieving husbands might come to faith. God wants us to stay together and as much as possible to stay together. He's not talking about that type of family. What I think he's talking about is when you are removed from your family situation, God puts you in the body of Christ that becomes your new family. Okay? And I didn't really, I mean, I kind of intellectually understood this, but I didn't really get it until my dad died. And I had brothers and sisters in Christ in this body stepping in and filling the void that my family couldn't because they're all the way down in Houston. That's when it started to become a reality to me. This is the family that God has put me in. All right? I'm, I'm like the brother, you know, the, to all of you guys. Some of you, I'm the younger brother. Some of you, I'm the older brother. And some of you, well, Matthew and I are about the same age. <laughs> I'm still older. That's family. God sees the need for it. He established it in the Garden of Eden. He reiterates in the book of Psalms that when you're lonely, he puts you into a family. He puts you into a home. Jesus reiterates it that when you choose to follow him, if you should be forsake your family for the sake of following him because they won't go with you, he is going to put you and root you into another family a hundredfold. Family. Do you think God is happy that families get together and celebrate Christmas? Because I do. I think God loves it. I think God looks at that and sees part of his original design and intent taking place. Like I said, don't get me wrong. Some of you probably don't have good memories of family getting together at Christmas. I do. I, we had three different Christmases. 
You know, my mom's family, we always celebrated on Christmas afternoon, and we always, I didn't know people had turkey and ham for Christmas until I was 16 years old. We always had lasagna and managoy, <laughs> and auntie pops. And my friend was saying something about having a ham for Christmas, and I thought, what, were you out of noodles? <laughs> I mean, ham and turkey, that's Thanksgiving. You know, Christmas is lasagna and managoy. And so um, we, we always did that Christmas day. Christmas morning was just our family. You know, that was, we got up at whatever time mom and dad said we were allowed to actually come up the stairs. And for two hours before that, we were on the stairs. <laughs> and then we were allowed to come up and, and go out and open our stockings, which I've already told you about. Not good memories. <laughs> Oranges rock. Oranges, yeah. 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 So... But Christmas Eve was always spent with my father's family. Now, mom and dad were divorced. They were married. But my dad's family, the Van Notes, they always celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve. That's when they got together. They opened their presents. And then Christmas morning was like, yay. <laughs> but so we would go to Christmas Eve. We'd go to the Van Notes side of the family. And, you know, all 30-some of us would get together and exchange gifts and play games. And my Aunt Sue would always make us sing Christmas carols. And we found out that there's not many Van Notes that can sing. And every year she would require us to do it. And, and then, you know, Christmas morning we'd get up and we'd celebrate with each other. And then Christmas afternoon, evening, we'd go over to uh, my mom's family and we'd celebrate with all of them. So, you know, Christmas family was great for me. Um, here, you know, we, we had seven and then eight and then nine and then ten and eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And it's just growing. And, and so, so we're catching up to what I grew up with. And I love family, and I think God loves family too. So celebrating Christmas with family, I think that's important to God because he established it, okay? Moving on. Love. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because if you don't get this one already, I don't have enough time to help you get it today. But if you don't have it today, talk to me. We'll set something up. Love. Let's talk about the very first one, John 3.16. For God so loved. He had so much agape. Unconditional. Not predicated on what I did or didn't do. It was based on who he was. He so loved the world. He didn't pick and choose. He loved them all. That he sent his only son. He only had one. And he sent him. That whoever would believe in him. Regardless of position. Regardless of upbringing. Regardless of doctrinal statement. Whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not die, would not be removed from his presence in eternity, but would have everlasting life. For he didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save it. That's love. I mean, really, that's the whole verse of why we're celebrating Christmas, because he sent his son on this day that we're celebrating, was Jesus born on December 25th? Who knows? We think it was probably in the springtime, but you know, we got 365 and a quarter days that we could be right. But we chose a day to celebrate, didn't we? Is it worth celebrating? Well, if we don't know, we gotta pick one, right? So December 25th it was. Oh no, oh my goodness, that's the pagan holiday of Owl, or Yule. What shall we do? It was done with purpose, people. They didn't, they didn't go, hey, let's blend the two. It was done to contend with a day that the enemy had stolen. The early church fathers knew what they were doing. They weren't trying to blend Christianity with paganism. They were trying to root Christianity in and root paganism out. So they chose December 25th. 
The same reason that we do Easter when we do Easter. Oh my goodness, it's Beltane or Esther or whatever. They did that on purpose. Because they are trying to bring in the good and root out the bad. Okay? So we, December 25th, we're celebrating the day that God sent his son down. Was it that day? No, but there was a day. There was a day, and on this day we commemorate it. We remember it. Why? Because it was his birth that led to his life and his ministry and ultimately his death and resurrection. Whereby we have eternal life. That's love. No greater love hath any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. What's really cool is, Jesus also says, I now call you friends. I don't call you disciples anymore. I call you friends. You know, throughout the Old Testament, I can think of one person that was called a friend of God. Can, can anybody think of more than one? But I can only think of one. But in the New Testament, Jesus tells them, I, I don't call you disciples anymore. I don't call you servants. I call you friends. And then he laid down his life for his friends. The greatest demonstration of love the world has ever seen. So, love. Romans 5, 8. Nick? But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. While we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's right! Awesome. Good job. God demonstrates his great love for us. While we're his enemies, while we are in opposition to him, we are opposed to him, he sent his son. That's love. It's easy to love those that love you back. What about those that hate you, despise you? Joy. Joy. A joyous occasion. I, I don't do joy real well. I don't get it. Okay? Um, that's actually one of those things that I've been praying that God would grow in me. One of those fruits that God would grow in me is joy. Because I don't really comprehend what joy is. I see it in people. There are just certain people that you're around all the time and there's just joy. It just kind of falls out of them. You know? You like being around them because they, even if a negative thing comes out of their mouth, it comes out in a joyous way and you realize it's not really negative. I love being around those people, but I can only be around them so long because they make me feel like a dirt bag. <laughs> Joy. Hebrews 12.2 Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, you think that's kind of a weird one to think about at Christmas. No, it's actually a perfectly accurate one to think about at Christmas. Because we like to kind of separate Christmas from Easter, and we can't. We do that at risk of totally missing the point of Christmas. Because the whole point of Christmas is Good Friday. And then Easter, the resurrection. So we don't dare separate the two. But Jesus, looking at the joy set before him, endured what was given to him in the interim. That is a really cool thing. You think things are going tough now? Look beyond. Look to the joy that is before you. We, should, we read a, a couple of scriptures last week about what heaven is going to be like, what the second return is going to be like. Look to those things. Because if that doesn't bring you joy, I'm, I'm questioning your understanding of scripture. Or your understanding of what's good. Because if you're content with what this life has to offer... You've set your standards really low. <laughs> really low. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Man, isn't that something really cool to pray for someone? 
that God would give you such joy and peace that through your believing, you may abound in hope. See, look, you, you don't have to work at this yourself. That's why I'm praying that God would do it in me. Because if I have to do it on myself, I'm in trouble. Because I, I, I don't have, you know, the stupid man's guide to being joyful. <laughs> I, don't, I can't find that in the library. But what I can find is that God promises me that if His Spirit dwells in me, and I will get myself out of its way, he will develop in me the attributes of His Spirit, which joy is one. Joy. I will be joyful. To have joy. To have peace. That I might exude hope. That I might abound in hope. What hope? The hope that what He's done is sufficient for what is coming. Not a hope unfulfilled. A hope in waiting. Do you understand that? It's like saying, I hope Christmas gets here soon. Well, it is soon. It's just relative to where you are in the calendar year. If you say that on January 2nd, you still have hope that it will get here soon because it will get here at the end of the year. You know it's coming. That hope is fulfilled, just not yet. It's not like we're hoping, gosh, I really hope this is true because I don't want to go to hell and I don't want to go to nothingness. You know, that's not the kind of hope he's talking about. It's talking about a hope that is fulfilled just not yet. Okay? So joy. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now think about that for a minute. Now I think the writer of Psalm at this point is talking about uh, possibly being in the temple, or just having God in his life, in his presence, and but but look at the, do you think this is prophetic? Because I think this is prophetic. I think this is talking about on that day when we will be with him. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Right now we experience in part, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? But I, I don't know anybody that has all of this right now. We experience in part, but then we experience fully. So in that day, we will have a fullness of joy because we'll be full. We will be content. For the first time ever, we will know what true contentment is because we will need nor want anything more. Ever. Because there will be nothing better than what we've got there. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What, what else are we going to desire? It's all met. It's all filled. If that's not cause for joy, then what is? Being in His presence for eternity. Uh, look, you know when I was a kid, I didn't really relish the thought of going to heaven because I didn't want to wear a white dress and play a harp. <laughs> I thought sitting on the cloud would be cool. But the white dress and harp, I wasn't sure about. Through reading His Word, through the revelation of His Word, I, I, I've understood that there is so much more to heaven. As a matter of fact, Paul even goes so far as to say, uh, no eye has seen or mind conceived. We can't even think about how good heaven's going to be. We can't even imagine it. I, I, well, I told you last week, I can't even picture gold so pure that it's like glass. I can't even imagine that. You, to me, gold is yellow. And, you know, it's either in a circle or a cross or a bar or an ingot or something, I, you know. I can't picture gold so pure that it's as glass. But that's what the streets are going to be made of. I mean, you look at these men that got a glimpse of heaven and they're struggling to try and put it into terms that we can understand who have not glimpsed it. And the language is of humans are not sufficient to convey the ideas of what God has done. Joy, to be in His presence. Peace, this is one that I love. And quite honestly, I think this is one that we should all be seeking, especially at this time of year. <clears throat> because don't we, don't we make ourselves so busy around Christmas? You know, things fill up and, and you get to the point where you're like, Oh yeah, I gotta go to that party. 
What? I mean, like, that, that tone of voice and party shouldn't go together ever, right? Because, I mean, we're, we're having a party, and that's supposed to be where you celebrate and have good times. And, and we're like, I'm party out. We, and, and then we get caught up in, in the obtaining of things that we might extend to others the perfect Christmas. And so we got to shop, and we got to shop, and we got to get, and we got to do, and, and all of a sudden our calendars are full. And we haven't taken time to stop and reflect on what it is that we're doing. We need a spirit of peace at this time. That our hearts would rest in what we're celebrating. We shouldn't come into Christmas exhausted. You know, I mean, well, I know Christmas morning, I'm usually pretty pooped because it's, you know, it's like 6 o'clock. And they, they're, yay, and about 6.30, I'm like, okay, presents are open, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> And I get my Christmas Day nap. But we shouldn't come into this celebration exhausted because of all the stuff that we've done. Remember Mary and Martha? Remember that? Martha comes up, hey, Jesus, look at her. What is she doing? She's just sitting. There's stuff to be done. There's eggnog to make. There's reindeer to roast. And she's sitting. What did Jesus say? <laughs> she has chosen the better way. Yes. Perhaps we need to spend a little bit more time in contemplation and quietness and stillness in this season. That we can truly appreciate what the season is about. Quiet contemplation. Making sure you set aside time for just you and God. Making sure you set aside time for just you and God and family that isn't based around accomplishing something. How about just accomplishing being together? Just, just enjoying one another's company. Luke 2.14, I love this. The angel appears to the shepherd. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Wow, do you realize God wants you to be at peace? Do you realize that God has designed you to operate in a nature of peace? That, that's an outflow of his spirit living inside of you and that we work so very hard to overcome that gift by keeping ourselves busy, too busy, You know, dishwashers are a fantastic invention. But did you know that with the invention of dishwashers came more dishes? Did you know that with all the time-saving <coughs> inventions that man has created, vacuums, laundry machines, washers and dryers, uh, do you realize that we have less free time now than we had before those things were added? Why? Because now we go, oh, look, I've got free time. What shall I do? And we fill it up. God wants us to be at peace. To have peace. Don't let the busyness of life clutter your life such that you are lacking peace. Seek it. Pursue it. Let God exude peace in your life. Psalm 34, 14. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Romans 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you think peace is important to God? I mean, think about heaven. You think God's rushing about? Interesting contrast here. Interesting contrast right here. Okay? Santa's workshop at the North Pole right now. What do you see? Chaos! The idea, right? 
The idea is rushing about trying to get everything done because we got December 25th is coming and we got to get everything out by December 24th. Chaos, right? Do you think that's going on in heaven? No. No. Which one do we pursue? We tend to pursue the North Pole approach, don't we? Rushing about and getting, it's coming! <laughs> Decorations. I love this one. Decorations. By the way, do you see all these? Thank you, Debors. Thank you, Manel. Thank you, Christopher and Benjamin and Shay. Uh, stayed after potluck on Sunday and put all the decorations up. Absolutely beautiful. If you have problems with the decorations, go back. Read how the temple was decorated. Because this is pretty tame compared to how the temple was decorated. And we haven't gone through and covered anything with gold. <laughs> <laughs> Check this out. Alright? I'm gonna this is gonna take a little while. And I lost part of my notes. <laughs> This is the explana exclamation, explanation excuse me, of Solomon's temple. So Solomon built the house and finished it, talking about the temple. He lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar from the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling. He covered them on the inside with wood. He covered the floors of the house with boards of cypress. He built 20 cubits to the rear of the house, the boards of cedar. Uh, the house that is the nave in front of the inner sanctuary was 40 cubits long. There was no stone seen. The inner sanctuary he prepared in the innermost part of the house. This is the most holy place. Um, I lost my place here, give me a second. Uh, to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. He overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid an altar of cedar, and Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with gold. And he overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also, the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary is overlaid with gold. In the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Five cubits was the length of one wing of the cherub, and five cubits was the length of the other wing. Angels. Both cherubim had the same measure and the same form. The height of one cherub was ten cubits, so, that, so was that of the other cherub. He put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house, and the wings of the cherubim were spread out, so that a wing of one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other touched the other. I haven't seen any of your trees that has an angel this big. <laughs> I haven't seen any of your houses that has an angel this big, much less two. Okay? And the wings of the cherubim were spread out, so the wing of one touched the wall, and the wing of the other touched the wall, and they touched each other. Around all the walls of the house, he carved engraved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. The floors of the house he overlaid with gold in the inner and outer room. For the entrance of the sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorposts were five-sided. He covered the two doors of the olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. You getting the picture here? It's awesome. A lot of time and attention went into the decorating of God's temple. Now remember last week when we talked about what the new heaven, the new Jerusalem is going to look like? The foundation is made up of 12 layers of precious stones. Each gate is made up of a single pearl. See, this is just a, a mere shadow of what is to come. You think God likes decorations? You think God wants your house like the monks have, where you basically have a room with a rock in it to sleep on? I don't see that in Scripture. I see that as punishment. I don't see that as blessing. When God is blessing people, what does He do? This is what His temple looks like. We look at the new temple that is coming. It's even better. The new Jerusalem is even better. Decorate your house. But remember why you're decorating. Don't be so caught up in the decorations that the decorations completely eliminate God. Completely eliminate the reason we're celebrating. Decorations. Yeah, God loves them. I think God is all for them. Even if you have a four-foot tree, 
even if you have a 12 foot tree, even if you just have, you know, the, the, the um, menorah set up. In the New Testament, Jesus is teaching in the temple, and the disciples are talking, and, and Jesus is teaching, and they're talking. Thank you guys for being more courteous than the disciples. <laughs> Jesus is teaching them, and what are they doing? Hey, look at that. <coughs> you see the temple? Look how impressive that is. It says, uh, they were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. Jesus is teaching them, and they're, they're sitting there astounded at all the cool stuff that went in the temple. Now keep in mind, this is the second temple. It's actually the second remodel of the second temple. So this is what's called Herod's temple, but it's really the temple of Zerubbabel. It's just been redone. He made it fancier. But it's not, it's a pale imitation to Solomon's temple. Remember when they came back from the exile and the temple was erected? And the young ones that had never seen the original temple were celebrating, and the older ones that had wept because it was so far removed from the glory of Solomon's temple. Remember that? And here's the disciples going, ooh. Don't get so caught up in the, the decorations on either side. You know, don't get so caught up on, oh, we shouldn't have any, or you should only have these. Um, Quite honestly, uh, okay, you want a little fat man in a red suit with a big bushy beard hanging off your tree, or I, I, okay, that's I don't know why. What does he do? But but don't get so caught up in that that you miss what we're celebrating, because quite honestly, Saint Nick was a really cool guy. Okay, so was Saint Patrick, but I don't see you guys putting things up with the dude with snakes. You see what I'm saying? Don't get so caught up in that. But also, don't get so caught up in overdoing. Underdoing, overdoing. We focus on why we're doing. Why we're doing. What are we about? What is all of this about? Ultimately, it is the path that goes to the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb, to the rider on a white horse that is coming back to claim his own. That, that's the path. We're looking back on the manger. Great. Absolutely fantastic. Let's do it with zeal. Understanding what it leads to. He didn't come just to be born and laid in a feeding trough. That wasn't the point. That was the start <coughs> of the point. Okay? So... Have peace this season. Have joy this season. Be merry this season in whatever context that you choose. Whether it be the, the solemn reflection, whether it be the joyous rapture, whether it be the festival spirit, have joy in celebrating the birth of Christ this season. But use it as an opportunity to testify. Right? 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 Because I mean, really, you know, like I said, I don't have a problem. People want to say happy holidays. Because this should be a holy day, shouldn't it? Or they feel like they're getting one over on us, saying, well, we're not going to say Christmas, but we're going to say holy day. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a holy day for me because of Christ. So, Merry Christmas. Okay? But understand why we're doing it. Have joy. Have peace. Be merry. Celebrate with family. And if you can squeeze in a little eggnog and roast reindeer, so much the better. And I'll make you some eggnog. Amen? Amen? Have joy this season. Don't get so caught up in what the world says is a successful Christmas. Don't be so busy. Even busy doing worthy endeavors that you forget what it is we're celebrating. Take time out. Have time alone with God. Be still before Him. Have an attitude of thanksgiving for all that He has done. Amen? Amen.